Coming up on this week in computer hardware, wait, did Intel just kill 10 nanometer desktops? A great cheap PC case, Google drops the Pixel 4, it's got radar, Nest Mini, and a hard release date for Stadia. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is, is Twitch. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 537, recorded on October 17th, 2019. Did Intel just kill 10 nanometer desktops? This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Plex. With Plex, you can organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos anywhere on any device. Plex is offering Twit listeners a 30-day free trial of Plex Pass, which gives you access to all their premium features. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter the code twit to start your free trial today. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most delightful, most engaging, most affordable, most expensive, most unhinged, and generally speaking, most practical hardware advice we can find for you each and every week. We talk about desktops, laptops, mobile, consoles, the Internet of Stuff, and oh so many other things. Today, however, I am not going to bore you with tales of mobile data and the complications in getting it when you're in an airstream i am however going to remind you that sebastian peak is here as he is each and every week and he is very excited or very angry i'm not entirely sure which about uh the state of 10 nanometer processors from intel mr peak thank you patrick you know we've been talking about 10 nanometer and intel's woes in Moving to that process, and for those of you not familiar, <laughs> Intel, their desktop processors for a while now has been using 14 nanometer process technology. And Intel is the one chip maker who has their own fab. They actually make their own chips. And this has been a point of pride for them for many years. It's given them a number of advantages over the last couple of decades. But Right now, they're kind of struggling because AMD can just take a CPU order to TSMC and have it produced at 7 nanometer. And Intel has been struggling for two or three years now, I think, getting to 10 nanometer from 14. So some rumors came out. Now, this is from a German hardware site called Hardware Lux. And uh, I was translating it with Google Translate, which, you know, kind of is amusing. It's always exciting. <laughs> Yes, like, uh, it's not really accurate, but it, the gist of it is basically that they said Intel's 10 nanometer is still problematic. And while they have come out with 10 nanometer mobile processors, the Ice Lake processors, those are small. They have relatively mm -hmm. low clock rates compared to desktop, especially at idle. And they're just not where they need to be for desktop 10 nanometer. And I kind of agree with that because otherwise wouldn't we have desktop 10 man nanometer already? But the the supposition here, and they have a chart, I think we were just looking at, that, that shows, according to their inside sources uh, that they did not name, of course, the desktop 10 <laughs> nanometer products had been axed. They'd just been cut and were going to continue along with 14 nanometer plus plus plus, I think, until about 2022 when Meteor Lake at 7 nanometer would appear, which... You know, th this would be pretty devastating news for Intel. This is all true. And this I found this story actually by a tech power and tech power up initially. And a number of outlets had, mm -hmm. had taken uh, this and kind of run with it. And throughout the day, I watched as I think it was Tom's hardware may have been the first one to report Intel's official statement on this, which is one sentence long. Uh, quote. We continue to make great progress on 10 nanometer and our current road back roadmap of 10 nanometer products includes desktop end quote. So, I mean, <laughs> that, that reminded me immediately of when AMD earlier this year canceled, discontinued uh, the Radeon right. 7, which had only been around for like five or six months and it was just gone. And their statement printed by Tom's hardware was, we continue to see strong availability of Radeon 7 in the channel. Like, that doesn't answer the question. Did you discontinue it or not? And it's like, just because it's <laughs> sitting out there on Amazon and at various retailers doesn't mean that you're still making it. Anyway, they, they finally sort of officially EOL'd it later, I guess. I don't know if they've ever come out and said they did. But for Intel to do this, on the other hand, 
would be devastating for them. So uh, I, I said in the little news post that I wrote about this, like I could speculate about a vague sentence like that and say that maybe it is technically correct, the best kind of correct. But what if you read between the lines and said, well, our current roadmaps, not the updated roadmaps we haven't released yet or the future roadmap that we'll share with the media, you know, on a Friday at 5.30 p.m. right before the holiday break. But I don't know any of that. That's just speculation, and, and I'm not going to be snarky and speculate. I just, that's, that's like the extreme side of it. I don't know where these rumors came from. We've been hearing rumors about Intel not doing so right. well on 10 nanometer. And obviously when they had to resort to 14 nanometer for the rest of their 10th gen mobile lineup, and those were the products with the higher clocks and the higher core counts, it seems like Ice Lake is going to be a rather limited release, and it's in very few products so far. So we will see. It's just kind of funny. Uh, uh, and by the way, along with this, like I think it was the same day, a new uh, video from noted uh, tech YouTuber Adored TV, who's typically on the AMD side of things, uh, had had released what he said was a leaked slide on a video of his that showed that in, Intel is having to lose about $3 billion to the price cuts that we talked about last time and marketing and so forth to compete with AMD because of how aggressive rise in pricing has been. So, you know, like we always say, mm. we'll wait with, we wait with bated breath. <laughs> this is actually <laughs> canceled or not because that would be... I mean, they're a publicly traded company. If 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 that's true, they're going to have to be very careful about how they message that. And I'm sure there'll be some very positive spin to put on the excitement of higher clock speeds and a uh, mature process technology instead of saying, yeah, we're, we're failing at 10 nanometer again. But Messy. I think we've talked about 10 nanometer a lot. We, can we just be done for the year? Intel, please, just release products so we can stop talking about this. <laughs> Release products or, or make a definitive statement that the products are not coming. Yes. Um, well, you know, other things that happened this week. Uh, Google Pixel 4 was announced. Uh, Dieter Bond over at The Verge did a really nice summary. Hands-on with the Pixel 4 and 4XL. While its camera improvements are nice, the focus is on face unlock, radar, over-the-phone hand gestures, faster voice commands. Uh, and it's interesting because there's literally a radar chip in this. The radar frequencies are not secured in India, so the phone won't sell in India, uh, which I just kind of found fascinating. Just the idea that the phone had gotten so complicated and required so many you know, radio frequency uh, licensing issues that they're just skipping a gigantic portion of the planet um of the planet's population uh the other thing we're hearing uh, from early reviews or early hands-on is that it feels much nicer it feels much more sophisticated it feels much more like a competitor with apple's iphones uh, or the high-end samsung phones um they've certainly of course done more with the camera but uh you know the night site uh looks promising I don't know if you can actually see on the Google Pixel 4 webpage, but you know we talked about this. I feel like we talked about this last week, where it's like, look at how cool the photography is, uh, the low light photography. But I'm sitting here staring at it and just kind of getting, uh, getting excited, um, given that I just picked up an iPhone, which has horrendous battery life, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, you know, the other big thing is is really, you know, I mentioned radar and chips and frequencies, but literally, uh, you know, what they're calling quick gestures it has radar to sense motion and there's a nice uh, a nice write-up on that again from the verge uh so motion sense um started as project solely i want to say back in 2015 and yes there literally is a radar chip in the pixel 4 and it has three basic modes presence is it can tell if if you're nearby or something or someone is nearby i don't know if it can tell the difference between say a cat and sebastian if one or the other of them is laying on the phone uh reach so that when you reach towards the phone it can flip the screen on and start activating itself and getting ready uh and of course uh gestures which people are using to control uh uh you know, it controls of apps. Um, you know, one of the things that was called out is like, you know, puttering or, or tickling a Pokemon. And uh, I am not a huge fan of gesture-based computing, uh, mostly because the execution has always been so 
relentlessly mediocre, especially on televisions. Um, you know, the idea that I'm going to reach my arm above my head to change channels by waving high in the sky is just, it was a bad idea then. It's a bad idea now, but this actually looks like it's well, th you know, it's been thought well through enough or thought through enough that it can actually be functioning. I'm kind of fascinated to see how this works in the field. I bring that up because one of the first things that came out, uh, uh, the BBC did a big write-up on this, is that the Pixel 4 will unlock even with your eyes closed, which may not sound like a big deal, but it means, for example, if your children or your spouse or your significant other or your abusive significant other wants to see what you've been doing, they just have to wait till you fall asleep and bring the phone to your face. Um, you know, Apple, of course, uh, and I think Daring Fireball did one of the bigger, like, you know, Google thinks their face recognition is up there with Apple's, but it can't even tell if you're asleep. And that sounds really silly when you start thinking about it until you realize that, yes, if you can hold a phone up to someone's face, uh, then you can get access to their phone. And that's actually probably a lot scarier uh, than you might be thinking at first. In any case, it's it seems like a, a design flaw to me. Um, you know, <laughs> Google actually does state in the docs for the Pixel 4 that your phone can also be unlocked by someone else if it's held up to your face even when your eyes are closed. Um, so I can't tell if that's sort of a calling it out as a bug or a feature, but you may not want to be running a face unlock on the Pixel 4. Um, should we get into the whole Pixel 4 speeds and feeds? Are you feeling that? You know, if you want to, we could go through the specs. We haven't talked about it yet, obviously. It was just announced officially after... You know, weeks, months of rumors and controlled leaks from <laughs> Google. So many rumors. Um, yes. You know, as you would expect, uh, boy, let's see, a 5.7 inch screen on the Pixel 4, 6.3 inch screen on the Pixel 4 XL. If, uh, where is it, where is it, where is it, where is it? I'm kind of shocked by the battery. The Pixel 4 is a 2800 milliamp hour battery. The Pixel 4 XL is a 3700 milliamp hour battery. Um, fast charging, of course. Uh, key charging. I'm delighted that both of them uh, have six gigabytes of LPDDR4X, which means absolutely fast smoke and switching between apps if you, you like to keep lots of apps open. Uh, not particularly surprised, Snapdragon 855, uh, nothing new there. Uh, 16 megapixel primary back camera, or should I just say rear camera, uh, and a 12.2 <laughs> megapixel rear camera. Um, the rear front facing camera, yes. It's terribly complicated, uh, but uh, you know, I, you know. My, again, my primary complaint with the Google Pixel and the the iPhone is that you can't add additional storage, which I find really frustrating. Uh, I've been traveling lately in a bunch of areas where there fundamentally is no internet connectivity, so to no longer have like 300 gigabytes of my favorite music on my phone is incredibly irritating and uh, necessitating sort of a creation of a system to actually manage the music in the car when uh, we're driving. Um, to tighten up security module, 2.84 gigahertz, 1.78 gigahertz, 64-bit octa-core, the Pixel Neural Core, Adreno 640 graphics. You know, they really, I think they've gotten to the point where other than adding more memory, I think they probably feel like you have enough processor. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> or, Adreno or graphics are just no not, joke. Yeah, they're pretty fast. Um, not particularly inexpensive, not particularly expensive. The Pixel 4 starts at $799. The Pixel 4 XL starts at $899. Uh, I wish there was more storage. You know, I pretty much say that all the time, but... I wish there was more storage. I'm also kind of amused that they have black, white, and orange as the colors for the phone. Well, so, you know, orange, it's it's the time of, of year. It's October, and, you know, maybe they'll have seasonal colors. Spicy. It'll be a red and green one later. <laughs> yeah. We did it for pumpkin spice. Um, so, hey, you know, if you thought, by the way, that the Pixel 4 unlocking with your eyes closed, it hasn't shipped yet, obviously, but uh, is problematic, you're going to love the issue uh, coming out of Samsung, who says they will issue a patch for a fingerprint recognition bug, uh, Galaxy S10, and certain covers seem to create a situation where the silicone cover is being recognized as a fingerprint. Uh or as a British user told the Sun newspaper this week, quotes Reuters, a bug in her Galaxy S10 allowed it to be unlocked regardless of the biometric data registered in the device. It was essentially a third-party screen protector. 
And uh, with a third-party screen protector in place, her husband was able to unlock the phone. And uh, Mm -hmm. so basically, essentially, some screen protectors create an issue where the phone case or the phone screen protector is recognized as a fingerprint. Uh, So, uh, you know, if you are worried about people accessing your Samsung phone, your <laughs> your Galaxy S10, you should probably take the screen protector off or turn off fingerprint recognition until that patch is released. Or more accurately, um, when the patch goes from Samsung to your carrier to you, which is always kind of frustrating. So. The, the whole, the concept of like an in-display fingerprint reader is something that I know Apple had struggled with and never realized they were, it is they a were, non-trivial problem. No, and think about like the iPhone 5, and I'm not sure about the rest of the yeah. industry, but the iPhone 5 I think was the first phone that had in-cell touch or possibly one of the original Nexus phones may have had this when they went to AMOLED displays. But uh, of course I say, did I say Pixel or Nexus? I don't remember now, but of course it was Nexus. <laughs> the, the problem is they were using in-cell touch, which already puts, instead of having a separate layer for your capacitive touch recognition they put that kind of in amongst the sub pixels like in mm-hmm. the grid of the lcd which you know the first batch of iphone fives you could take your phone and go really fast from side like from corner to corner and freeze the display and so they kind of fixed the timing on that so you could no longer do that but to, to then add to incel touch some sort of fingerprint reader well, it sounds like it would be possible, and obviously it has been realized it is possible. There's got to be some kind of margin for error that makes it less than ideal. If you still had, if phones were a little bit thicker and you still had that separate capacitive touch layer above the screen, I wonder if this wouldn't have been solved a long time ago. Especially if you add in something like force touch where it only starts reading the fingerprint on the screen when it detects that you've pressed down a certain number of like grams of force, but... These are all problems that uh, we have no control over as consumers. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's also... Yep. I was going to say, they're using fairly sophisticated ultrasound to detect the fingerprint through the screen. So I will be kind of curious to see what the patch is or how they patch that or how they change that when they do that. So. Really, unless you're using a Galaxy Fold, you know, and I don't even know if there are screen protectors for that, that you're even allowed to use other than the one that comes from the factory, but maybe just don't use a screen protector, which uh, I, it makes me cringe partly because I have a four year old and I worry about the safety of my phone. If it's not constantly in a case with the screen protector over it, but you know, these phones are pretty durable. I've carried a phone for long periods of time, like a year or more with no screen protector. And yeah, you'll see a couple little scratches here and there around the edges that you can look at in the light, but Gorilla glass is pretty strong. So maybe just go without a screen protector, I guess. Yeah, as many screens as I've broken in the last couple of years, there will be no going without a screen protector. Oh, okay. <laughs> Although, you know, I've, I've, I've managed to keep the last two phones with their screens intact. But Dad, look, what, uh, look where it got you. Look where it got you with your, with your uh, Motorola phone, Patrick. Screen right protectors can't protect from everything. <laughs> That's right. Oh, goodness. Um it is true. Screen protectors can't protect everything. There's knowledge there. There's there's deep wisdom in that, Sebastian. Yeah, we should call that out. Like the screen protectors don't protect whatever I said. Screen protectors don't protect you from everything. Pull quote <laughs> on the on the podcast posts, and then people scratching their heads like, "What are you, what are you talking? This is a computer hardware podcast. Talk about computer hardware." Oh my goodness! I, I, we've been covering, of course, uh, along with. The 10 nanometer issues over at Intel, of course, we've uh, had our eyes on everything going on at Huawei. Uh, of course, who was added to the export blacklist in May. Um, that basically means uh, American companies can't sell parts to Huawei, uh, including, for example, the actual you know, Android. Google can't do Android or, or the Play operating system on Android-based phones that Huawei might sell. Um, but uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, sales, despite... Uh, that sales are up 25%, writes the New York Times, uh, 86 billion, quote, an increase of nearly 25% from a year earlier. And uh, 
apparently sales picked up this summer to say the very least. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the issues, of course, one of the primary issues was concern about uh, Chinese influence on 5G networks or Chinese control of 5G networks. And uh, Huawei also said that they had signed something like 60 uh, 5G contracts, so another 10 from their last report a few months ago uh, where they were up to 50s. Um, so, you know, it's... Uh, it's interesting also because um, some American suppliers, it's, one of the interesting things about the New York Times article points out that, quote, some of the companies American suppliers have determined that they can lawfully continue selling to Huawei certain non-sensitive products that are made outside the United States. Um, you know, the, uh, I'm kind of curious, like, you know, apparently there's going to be some export licenses issued um, that will, uh, to American companies that will assist Huawei in obtaining parts. Um, so, you know, for example, Micron, I think is selling a lot of memory to Huawei. Uh, I'm kind of curious, uh, to see how that works out. Um, you know, again, the mate, we talked about the mate 30 when it launched, it didn't have access to the Google play store. Um, so I'm kind of curious where these sales are coming from and, and how they're doing it. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy for Huawei and anybody who works there because nobody wants a bunch of people out of work. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that despite the ban on sales and the ban on exports, they still managed to have a monster, monster gain in revenue. We'll see if that holds over time. We'll also be curious to see how 5G networks end up getting uh, rolled out, who rolls them out, and how exactly they're working. Um, but it is so early, and the technology is so not ripe. Um, I was talking to uh, an acquaintance of mine who's dealing with some of the super stuff, uh, incredibly fast and incredibly low-range 5G in New York City. And it's apparently immensely frustrating to test because anytime somebody walks between you and the little microcell, uh, things change. <laughs> so um, hold off on 5G, Sebastian. I know you're you're eager, but... I just I just want 600 megahertz. I'm happy with LTE. Just give me more range. Give me better service inside of buildings on T-Mobile. That's all I ask. Yeah, it's not going to happen with. Uh, well, it could happen if they deploy the a conversation for another day. And this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Plex. You remember Plex? Plex, video, home theater, streaming, awesomeness. It is an amazing interface, and it has become so much more over the last few years. Plex brings together all the media that matters to you in a single app, and it's available on any device, no matter where you are. You can organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos for free. You can stream your favorite podcasts, web series, and news for free. And if you upgrade to the Plex Pass, for less than five bucks a month, you get the best of Plex with exclusive and early access to premium features like offline accessibility. Plex will let you download your movies, your shows, your music, your photos to your mobile devices for offline enjoyment wherever you go. You can watch live broadcast TV and DVR with a Plex Pass, an antenna, and a tuner. You can stop paying for cable, still enjoy great TV. The news feature in Plex brings you quick access to over 190 sources for national, international, and local news, something like 80% of U.S. markets. This is all for supported Plex streaming players. And you can enjoy premium music features, playlists based on your music preferences. And, I mean, the thing that originally attracted me to Plex, a cinema-like experience. When you're watching your personal movie collection, trailers, behind-the-scenes features, never-before-seen footage... And it's so much easier to switch users with Plex Home. You can create customized managed accounts and make switching users easy with Plex Home. Plex Pass also gives you Plex Pass perks when you get exclusive access to promos and discounts on partner products. And you get to use the newest features before everyone else. More features, early access to new features, tons of stuff to make getting your media into your household and on your mobile devices Cut the cable cord and save big. Plex is offering Twit listeners a 30-day free trial of Plex Pass, which gives you access to all their premium features. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter the code TWIT to start your free trial of Plex Pass today. That's plex.tv slash twit. And we want to thank Plex for their support of this weekend computer hardware. You know what another plus oh. about Plex? You don't have to worry about your Blu-ray collection being destroyed. 
You know, you, <laughs> kids can go through your movie collection virtually. That's the way it should be. Oh, I, I, wa- I heard this strange sound coming from my living room, and it <laughs> no. was the beginning of the. Uh, well, it was. Uh, it wasn't the worst sound I've heard coming from my living room. This was a long time ago. And uh, my oldest had climbed up on the chair and climbed up on the back of the chair. And I had this big wall covered with Blu-rays. And he was grabbing Blu-rays and whipping them over his shoulder one after the other. <laughs> and they were just literally like hitting the wall of books, uh, the bookshelves uh, on the other side. And hitting that and then ricocheting down to the ground. And I discovered that A, that yes, the... Bluetooth, uh, or I should say, Blu-ray C- or Blu-ray discs, do have a significantly harder and stronger coating than DVDs. Uh, and B, uh, it was time to digitize everything and get the discs out of the living room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a Wham! freakish story Wham! involving a, my German Shepherd and a one of those spray bottles of like a sunblock. My wife had oh, left. Goodness. On our sofa table one day, we come home, we were gone, we come home, and the dog had chewed it, and when he, she, punctured this bottle, apparently, just following the trail, we're doing, like, forensics, like, okay, this is where the dog punctured the bottle, this is where the bottle spun wildly out of control through the entire living room, coating the outside of a number of things, including the Blu-ray collection, which was on a shelf with no glass or door in front of it at the time, so painstakingly cleaning hard dried on whatever this was off of the spines of blu-rays for like two days after this and not to mention it covered you know the dust cover of my turntable and the outside of my speakers and it was just not a good day Uh, could be worse i have a story involving a, a friend a cat a bird and a hiding place oh no okay there well Soon to be, uh, you know, in a, a short story form. Jackson Pollock, yeah. Um, <laughs> in any case, we should probably shout out uh, Google announced uh, uh, the shiny, happy, lozenge-like uh, Google Nest Mini, $49, engineered for sound, designed for your home, apparently containing 40% more bass. Uh, that's the quotes uh, from the nice people at... Uh, at Google. Um, where is it? I, I just love that quote. Engineered for sound, designed for your home, 40% stronger bass than the original Mini. Um, mm-hmm. Some people say it sounds almost exactly the same. Uh, I'm down for any type of speaker improvement in tiny, inexpensive devices that actually uh, makes it better. Uh, the kind of the classics you see there, the fabric covering that is kind of ubiquitous on uh you know, Google devices, and now, of course, uh, lots and lots of Amazon devices, too. Um, they're working on improving voice recognition. Still no ability to uh, connect this to a better set of speakers through streaming, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, they still have a fantastic collection of partners uh, for streaming. Uh, if you are new to this, um, it's kind of impressive, actually, uh, how much. Again, we, we talked about this a couple of years ago seems like a couple years ago now, a year ago, uh, probably two years ago now, how Amazon had this huge lead over Google and, uh, uh, you know, with the A-L-E-X-A slash E-C-H-O environment. And Google did this really hardcore dash to catch up on that. And uh, it seems like they really have on so many levels when you start looking at the partner lists on these and the features that are available. Um, you know, the... Uh, DC power jack instead of micro USB, which I think is a smart improvement. Same muting switch as before. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, there's a nice article up on uh, CNET uh, when they do the review. Molly Price wrote that up over at CNET, and uh, the uh, I love this. The team at Google spent hours testing the audio transparency of dozens of fabrics to create a more eco-friendly cover for the Nest Mini. The speaker's top fabric is made from 100% recycled plastic, and the external enclosure is made from 35% recycled plastic. Google told me that one half-liter plastic bottle makes enough fabric to cover a little more than two speakers. And uh, I just thought that was highly amusing. Um, I also like to put a wall mount on the back of that one. That's something else that uh, that's something else that uh, Molly Price calls out over at CNET, uh, which I think is really smart. Um, 
given that uh, counter space is usually so much more difficult to find than just being able to plop one up on the wall. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. One of the things they attribute the sound changes or the fuller base or the 40% more base, as, as Google puts it, uh, is that they opened up, changed around the component. Uh, uh, they made it, changed the speaker, made the device larger, which seems pretty obvious when you're looking for more base. And apparently they created more space around the components uh, to help with the base response of the device. Um, you know, the other thing that's interesting is they have a. Uh, chip or machine learning chip inside there so it will eventually learn the your most common command so it can respond to them without actually having to go to the cloud which i find kind of fascinating and really really curious to see how that works out long run um the uh uh you know i think it's kind of interesting and it's not just simple commands but like you know, if you play a bedtime song, if you ask for a particular podcast to come on, uh, if you, you know, turn on, you know, if it's like, you know, turn on my coffee machine and turn on the lights in the kitchen every morning at 6 a.m., um, it will actually learn the actions and, you know, give itself the ability to do that remotely. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty slick. I also can say, you know, as much as I poo poo it, because it's I'm I'm curious to hear this one next to a a an actual uh, home mini speaker because it's it's you know they did radically change the speaker design. I'm also curious if they they got any more excursion or X Max out of that speaker, um, but uh, it is a pretty significant change from uh, the actual speaker that was inside the home mini. So um, I'm trying to of them together and make a little uh, home theater setup out of them. That'd be an interesting. Uh, yeah. Story. <laughs> Can you synchronize them like that? Can you put two together and have stereo? I don't know. Well, no. Off the top of my head. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, this is also kind of curious to watch as, as the sort of Google Nest relationship continues to settle itself out um, yeah. with the essentials. Sucking back in. of it's, it's so hard to tell where Nest is at any given point. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, not a huge lot of changes, but some, some modest ones that may attract people that are looking to update their device. So you, uh, you are obsessed. Well, actually I say you, it was Kent Burgess. You wrote this up for, uh, uh, for PC I always, I automatically assume when I see a case review, I automatically assume yeah. Sebastian wrote it. Uh, yeah. but in this case, it was actually Kent Burgess. Um, why was he so excited about the airflow inside of this case? Well, if if you've if you're familiar with Fantex, they've had this really popular case, this B400 case. They had a regular and a silent version of it. It came out early 2016, and you know it's it's still around. They still sell it, but they have a new version of it. And not only is it a little bit less expensive, this is starting at 69.99 um, as reviewed. There's a version with RGB effects and whatnot, and that is $89.99. But this is just kind of your plain, nice-looking case with a tempered glass side panel. But unlike so many cases on the market that feature such things, this has one of those metal mesh front panels joining the ranks of cases like the Fractal Meshify C as a case that's designed primarily for gasp airflow so that you have better temperatures and your fans can spin at a lower speed and produce less volume. So it's one of those things where you have a, a completely open front like this, essentially because of the, the metal mesh, but then you'd think that would increase the volume because you're not blocking the sound with a solid front panel, but then everything spins so much slower than it ends up being even quieter than a lot of cases that do have a solid front panel. In fact, the P400 was a solid front panel design all along. So for them to just add a mesh front panel to it is is it seems like a logical step. Give some, give people an option. This is like a three plus year old case design. Make it a little bit less expensive. Kent went through the whole process inside and out with this case, and the only thing I noted in going over his findings, it could be a bit problematic that the front panel does not have a screen filter. I think mm -hmm. their argument is that the mesh is fine enough that itself is the screen filter. So you just pop off the front panel and go wash that off, put it back on. So, I mean, if that works, 
we never get to use these things long enough to be able to say like, you know, six months down the road, I was noticing I had to vacuum out the inside of my case more than I used to. But <laughs> in his time with it, uh, in assessing it and testing it, Kent was very pleased with the case. Fantex offers this alternate uh, vertical mounting like so many companies do. That was an extra purchase. But he did a build with the standard horizontal mounting, with the vertical mounting, and overall was impressed. I mean, no surprises if you're familiar with this case design already. And there's a lot of P400 based builds out there, I think. I know uh, certain companies also were using this case for a while. I know I buy power and maybe one of the others was using this case in certain builds, but decent noise levels. But again, that's it's going to be based on what components you're using inside because the front panel is going to let all that noise out. And obviously very good temperatures. In fact, slightly better temperatures using the standardized airflow test that Ken has come up with. Uh, open test bed, slightly inferior than uh, the standardized airflow inside the P400A because there's more airflow. Like I've, I've determined this myself more than once. So you have a GPU, especially the modern GPUs that have a zero, zero RPM idle fan. You're going to have lower temps in certain circumstances inside of a case if it has any kind of airflow. Airflow inside mm. of this case is good enough. Even with the one intake fan it came with and the one exhaust fan to be slightly better than just an open test bench in the same room with the same components, which is always great to see. So you should have good temps with this. And if you go $20 more and get the version that has the RGB fans up front, then you should have a little bit better performance still throwing a second fan up front is only going to enhance that that uh, positive air pressure that gets the hot air out of your case, especially if you're using a non-blower-style GPU. So you give it the gold award. Non-blower style. Yeah, non -blower, you know, all aftermarket pretty much. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a aftermarket blower, at least not in the modern era. <laughs> I think Sapphire was actually one of the first to do a blower cooler, if not the first. So it wasn't like a reference design thing initially. But anyway, nice case. And I, I'm loving this trend for cheaper cases too. Like more airflow, good. Less expensive, very good. $69 for a case with tempered glass that looks nice, well built. That's Down pretty awesome. That. Yeah. Not a thing wrong with that. Uh, also, not a thing wrong with, well, gaming and Stadia. And uh, this is actually kind of exciting. If you've been waiting for updates to Stadia, that's one of the other things that happened along with the, the uh, Nest Mini. Um, Google Stadia launching November 19th. That's uh, 9 a.m. November 19th. That's when the early Stadia Founders Edition purchasers will get theirs. It'll start arriving and the system will be turned on when it arrives, presumably, unless you get yours before 9 a.m., in which case I'm really, really sorry. Um, that, of course, is the, uh, well, you know, Google's going to stream all the things in terms of gaming, and they are convinced they have a system that will allow them uh, to have considerably better performance than all of the other systems we've seen attempting to stream uh, games over the internet to uh, your devices. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little concerned about the way I think they are going about this, by the way, right. and I, I can't re reference the, the site I was reading, but the only way you can counter the lag that does exist, just waiting for things to go from point to point, is to anticipate the next move. In other words, to some extent, it may or may not be playing for you, anticipating what your next move would have been. If that's the case, it kind of takes it takes the point away from actually playing the game. Why not just watch a playthrough of the game if Google Stadia's uh, AI is like, oh, you're about to go left, aren't you? Because that's a logical next thing to do in this at this point. Uh, then, you know, I, I hope that's not the case. But how else are you going to get around lag unless they have just set up these things everywhere? If, if you're very close to the next uh, Stadia server cluster, then lag would be a, a much less of an issue. Yeah. We wait with bated breath. I don't know. Um, Red Dead Redemption, Mortal Kombat 11, Kina. Play all of these at 9 a.m. on your TV, laptop, desktop, and select tablets and phones. Uh, 
I'm sorry. Apparently, Stadia Founders Edition will get it first, and the uh, Founders Edition and Premier Edition uh, purchasers will get three months of Stadia Pro, which will include Destiny 2, the collection. Um, 4K HDR with 5.1 surround sound when playing on your TV. That's what they're saying. Okay. And uh, they're also directing everybody to stadia.com for all of the information on uh, streaming and all of the other things, um, which they, oddly enough, seems to have buried. Oh, wait. No, about Stadia. We have pre-order, 60 frames per second, 4K resolution, HDR 5.1. So, recommended minimum is 10 megabits per second. That's 720p, 60 frames per second stereo. You will need somewhere between 30 and 35 megabits per second to do HDR video, 60 frames per second, and 5.1 surround. So, you'll need a big, fat, healthy connection. I will not test my connection right now because that will cause the video to stop. And <laughs> Sebastian will burn it, burst into tears. Kevin will say terrible things about me. Um, and then uh, coming next year, Stadia Base, which is a 1080p resolution, 60 frames per second stereo for free. You'll be able to buy games whenever you want. So no free games on that one. So I, I, I will, I, you know, looking forward to it. Don't have that kind of bandwidth to throw around uh, <laughs> at this particular moment for gaming. So... Uh, you found something really, really, really cool for fans of DOS games. Yes. Well, the Internet Archive has, they did this, I think the last big initiative was around 2016. 2,500 more games were just added, I think, at the beginning of this week. So the library of available MS-DOS era games that are like the full versions of which are just freely available now on the Internet Archive is, is pretty staggering. At this point, I went through over the last couple of days and just kind of looking at different games and software titles. And there's quite a bit of just disk images with scans of the original disk or any supporting documentation. A lot of the older games are simply in folders like original DOS install folders and that sort of thing. But it's been a big undertaking. Obviously, things like good old games exist. And that's where you can purchase the old games and they're sort of wrapped in pre-configured installers that use DOSBox primarily to have them run on your modern PC. And they use it for all the, for the DOS side of things, they use it for Windows and Mac and uh, any Linux support they may have, of course, would also be via DOSBox. And, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole like DOS gaming on a modern PC via DOSBox because, you know, there's volumes written about that online already and it's a fantastic thing. They allow you to play right inside the browser. So if you don't want to download the file yourself, set up DOSBox yourself, you can just play inside of your browser on any modern PC that's reasonably fast. And some of the games have bigger downloads associated with them than others. There might be a game that's a few kilobytes, like 600 kilobytes. There might be a game that's 170 megabytes. Just depends on what needs to be locally downloaded or it's actually run in the DOSBox instance on your browser. So you're not streaming the game. You're actually playing it locally. Cool. But just, it's fun to go, go through this. Like you can follow, the, there's a blog post at uh, the Internet Archive and uh, any number of outlets have been reporting on this all week. But just go over there, check it out, scroll through. Everybody's putting up like their picks for most underrated or best DOS games of the era. And there's a lot of really good titles that would have been like triple a titles back in the day now it's not just obscure stuff hmm. that's available now it's not just obscure it's stuff sorry <laughs> yeah i, I mean I, I love this era of gaming myself and it, there, i i love the limitation of it because when when you just couldn't go very far as far as graphics special effects or even sound of course right. sound is something that Many computers at that time were still relying on just PC speaker beeps, like square wave music. Level design, gameplay, story were all you could really uh, do to set yourself apart or to make an engaging game experience. So there's some stuff that it'll look absolutely horrible. I think if my son ever looks at DOS gaming, unless I introduce it to him now, he's just going to look at me like, what are you talking? What do you see here? Like this there's like 16 pixels on the screen. He's well, gonna be, on one you know, hand, yeah. I mean, 
on one hand, yes, but on, on the other hand, some of these games um, are extraordinarily creative. Um, you yeah. know, uh, I mean, Tetris seems so simple. And people still play it and, and you know, variations of it on their phone. Uh, it's also really funny to look through some of these uh, titles and, uh, you know, see some of the really peculiar things that are showing up. Um, you know, Tony and Friends and Kellogg's Land, the train accolade. I mean, what it blows my mind is how many of these I never, ever heard of. Wingnuts, Wipeout, Wipeout, I remember. Um the Three Stooges, <laughs> Slugger, Smolensk to Moscow. There's just yeah, there's, a ton of, you know, yeah, Monkey Island, The Secret of Monkey stuff, Island. Yeah. yeah. That was a classic. Yep, that's Scrabble, also a classic of a very different way. But it's just kind of amazing how much is on there. You can play the original DOS levels of Lemmings. I put that into the chat. But that's been on there. I think oh. they put that in 2017. But... There's another example of a game. It originally came out on the Amiga in 1991. Shortly thereafter, right. there was the DOS port. And that's just... You can get lost playing that game. It's, it's been on every <sighs> platform imaginable. It's been on handhelds. It's But just <laughs> playing playing DOS Lemmings with that like, ad-lib FM synthesized sound to me is just... <laughs> there's something the about lemmings it. Lemmings go marching along. Yeah. Dvorak on typing. Oh my goodness. Wow. So many strange and wondrous memories here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, we apologize for not having an episode last week. Um, if you didn't get the news, uh, here in Northern California, we have this issue, or to say the state of California has had this issue with power lines possibly lighting trees on fire and creating these massive uh, wildfires. So there was an experiment uh, with turning off the power, which is what they need to do to prevent the power lines from lighting trees on fire if they haven't been cut clear or particularly dry or damaged or get blown down in a windstorm. Windstorms were predicted. Um, so the crew at Twit headquarters in Petaluma powered all the systems down because I'll give you a hint. Uh, if you yank the power cord or just shut down the power, um, to, uh, an entire studio, it tends to be bad. Uh, and then when they fire the power back up, it tends to be even worse. Uh, see surge brown out and various other things. Uh, you know, expensive electronics don't like to have their power cords ripped out as satisfying as that may be. Um, so that's why we couldn't record last week. And, uh, we, uh, would love to get some questions for you for next week. If you can email Twitch this week in computer hardware, we call it Twitch at twit.tv or tweet at Sebastian Peek or at Patrick Norton. Uh, if this is your first episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, welcome. Again, you can get all the information about the show, how to subscribe, and all the older episodes, video or audio, at twit.tv slash twitch. Uh, I'm Patrick Norton. You can find me here at Twitch. Uh, Sebastian Peake is the editor-in-chief at PCPer.com and writes a ton of good stuff, as does everybody else who writes for PCPer. So head over to PCPer.com. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we want to thank you so much for listening to This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch. <laughs>